In this video, we focus on heat flow paths in legacy and high performance facades that are often missing from building simulation models. Reveals are ubiquitous in residences and office buildings. In both high performance and traditional masonry facades, depth is a key attribute. Depth introduces a complex interplay of light and air movement, as well as a myriad of paths for heat flows and divergent surface temperatures to evolve. As a vector for heat transfer, how do reveals actually stack up? In this small room, the reveals are roughly 6% of the facade surface area. And there's a short path between much of that reveal and ambient conditions. In office facades, exuberant use of deep framing and offset glazing panes adds up to a serious difference between the actual inside surface area and a simple flat projection. On a cloudy spring day, that framing approached 60 degrees C and intercepted a considerable portion of the solar radiation entering the office. When presented with this 2008 model, which attempted at least a minimum facade abstraction, the engineering team thought it was a waste of time. The demand for high-performance facade accentuates the depth of facades that are ever more common in our built environment. Indeed, facades with lesser performance goals have also been on a depth binge. Am I the only one to wonder at the embedded chaos in the deployment of rain screens and commercial facades? Why do we keep going there? And then there are traditional stone and masonry structures. I live in one. Their depth of 800 millimeters easily includes reveals of 400 millimeters or more and large surface areas with short paths to ambient conditions. And yes, there are facades with minimum internal reveals. And yes, there are facades that are actually thin and are aligned on a single plane yet we habitually abstract facades which are not thin into a collection of two-dimensional entities aligned onto single planes. Here's a recent model that has separated the framing elements and the glazing in the facade. In the elevation, it looks all right. In section, not so much. Is it good enough? Especially where minor faults in facades can make or break something like a passive house certification. Do we need to alter our habits? If you undertake a 2D analysis of heat flow or look up thermal bridge values on an accredited D-cell site, it's easy to note that the flux and temperatures it reveals can be markedly different from a typical wall section. It really is early days translating these snapshots of steady state patterns from the 2D analysis programs into entities in our building models. To appreciate the implications of extruding the thickness of a facade components from a base plane, let's look at a residential building form. It's ubiquitous in many regions, and this building form can be found across a range of construction epochs. We we'll use the older facade types, which are problematic in cooler regions, to accentuate the impact of model creation decisions when the facade has been abstracted into a collection of flat entities with the bounds of the room at the inside face of the facade. The outside reveals, you see, are, well, they're for shading calculations. The thickness of the elements is expressed, though we get something that begins to look like an actual building. When we place the glazing in the frame in line with the inner face of the wall, we miss out on the reveals, and all the thermal exchanges at the surfaces of a reveal, and that the unreal nature of the extrusion that we've made, we could see in the missing corners and at the eaves and between the floor levels. One key point is that the outside surface area differs from the inside, and a simple extrusion of the polygon fails to capture this. The second point is that inclusions of thermal bridges do not fully compensate for the missing surface area of the reveals. So to illustrate the impact of reveal decisions, let's have three variants. One with flush frames, one with a 100 millimeter internal reveal, and a 200 millimeter reveal. For each of the models, I ran an annual simulation using a typical UK weather pattern. 
this case Leeds, with a diversity of occupancy and heating set points typical for the living and non-living spaces. What is of interest is what differences the change in reveals has introduced in terms of the internal volume of the dwelling, the total internal surface area. With no reveal, we get an initial volume and inside surface area for the living and the non-living spaces. Given that the wall is an older epoch solid masonry wall, it's not surprising that the building performs po poorly in terms of kilowatt hours over the year. Introducing a 100 mm reveal to all the windows increases the internal volume as well as the inside surface area. In the case of a 200 mm reveal, the volume and inside surface areas further increase. From the base case to the case with 200 mm reveals, we get an additional volume of 1.2 cubic meters in the living and dining and kitchen and an initial 1.7 meters cubed in the non-living spaces. That's 2.9 meters cubed for the dwelling. So we get an additional 2.3 square meters of inside surface area for the living spaces and 5.3 square meters for the non-living spaces. That's 8.6 meters squared for the dwelling. With the normalized heating on an annual basis, for the living spaces it increases 12.5 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, and for the non-living spaces by 13 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Are those big numbers? Well, if we were to take away the definition of thermal bridges from the model, yeah, that has more impact. But consider though that those psi values are the conservative K1 table values used in the UK for folk who can't be bothered to supply a calculated value. Beyond simple metrics such as annual heating demands, the being explicit with internal reveals gets us, well, a better air volume in the spaces that's much closer to reality. And for thermal comfort, the reveal surfaces might impact perceptions for folks that happen to be standing close to the facade. And for visual comfort and lighting studies, the light actually has something to bounce off of. The elephant outside the room, well, that's external reveals. Going beyond treating reveals only in terms of shading well, there's a host of other heat transfer fasts that are realistically getting undercounted. Sunlight falling on in the outside reveal? No, it's not there. Doesn't get counted. There are no surfaces that the sunlight can reflect from. Long wave rating exchanges? Hey, they're not there. The glass probably sees a lot less of the sky. Convection exchanges it reveals? Okay, let's say that thermal bridges sort of cover that. And thermal bridges don't know about sunlight falling on a reveal. They don't know about radiant losses from reveals. And we know that lots of construction types have a substantial thermal inertia. And that's not, nothing that psi values take into account. Honestly, beyond touching on the limitations inherent in our current abstractions of facades being thin, the real elephant in the room is that there are an awful lot of facades that are not well represented by our typical 1D heat transfer approaches. They're crying out for workable options for 2D and 3D heat flows. We really need to start that discussion.